On this episode of China Uncensored, Hong Kong and China, one country, two systems. Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. In my recent episode about the One China policy, I explained how both the People's Republic of China, aka Mainland China, and the Republic of China, aka Taiwan, claim to be the legitimate government of China. But Taiwan isn't the only one battling against the communist regime. There's also... Um, no, I'm not actually talking about Japan right now. Uh, no, not Vietnam either. Wait, no. No. No, it's Hong Kong. This episode is about Hong Kong. Hong Kong's relationship with China has been unique, to say the least. It became a British colony after the Opium War, was seized by Japan during World War II until the British reclaimed it in 1945 and returned to Chinese rule in 1997. Well, kind of. The China Hong Kong used to be a part of was long gone. The last time Hong Kong was a part of China, China was still ruled by emperors. But in 97, it was the Communist Party that reigned, and that was cause for concern to many. While mainland China suffered from the social and economic ravages of disastrous communist policy, in the 20th century, Hong Kong became a relatively prosperous and democratic island. So what would happen to that economic prosperity and freedom when one of the most oppressive regimes on earth took control? That's why after the handover in 97, it became a part of China, but also was not a part of China. When the Chinese Communist Party gained control over the island, remember they had never been in control of it before, Hong Kong became a special administrative region to be ruled under policy of one country, two systems, and was allowed to keep a degree of autonomy. Basically, the rest of the world wouldn't let the Chinese regime do whatever it wanted in Hong Kong. That's why to this day, Hong Kong still has far greater rights than anywhere else in China. Now, that never really sat well with the Chinese regime. I mean, when you try to convince people that the Tiananmen Square massacre never happened, and yet in Hong Kong they have annual rallies commemorating the massacre, it's just got to be so dang frustrating. So over the years, it's been slowly eroding away those liberties that Hong Kong was supposed to have. And that's left the region a tinderbox of political frustration between pro-Beijing and pro-democracy groups that only needs a tiny spark to go off. And the sparks have been flying. Beijing's first big attempt at controlling Hong Kong came in 2002 when Hong Kong Basic Law Article 23 was pushed forward. Hong Kong had become a refuge for many fleeing persecution in mainland China, and one of the largest groups of refugees were Falun Gong practitioners. After the bloody genocide against the spiritual practice began in 1999, Hong Kong became the first step for practitioners fleeing persecution from the Chinese regime. Practitioners in Hong Kong then actively spoke out about the crimes against humanity perpetrated just over the border. By 2002, the persecution that former Chinese leader Jiang Zemin had promised would take only three months had then gone on for three years and was getting kind of costly. According to Chinese diplomat Chen Yongling, who defected to Australia in 2005, opposing Falun Gong is the CCP's first priority. They use 60% of their money and energy in oppressing Falun Gong, and another 20 to 30% in going against Taiwan, and the rest, 5 to 10%, used on every other issue. It was also making the Chinese regime look pretty bad internationally, and the fact they were so close but so far was infuriating. The solution was Article 23. Article 23 was an anti-subversion law that would allow the Hong Kong government authority to attack any group banned by the People's Republic of China. No investigation needed. Police would have the authority to enter residential buildings and arrest people at any time without warrant or evidence. Would Falun Gong have been targeted? Well, considering in 2001 Hong Kong's former chief executive Tung Chi Hua called Falun Gong an evil cult, and former security chief Regina Ip called it a devious organization holding heretical views, rhetoric used by the Chinese regime to justify the persecution, it's likely these powerful pro-Beijing officials would have jumped at the chance. But then the protests began. First, 65,000 marched against it. When that didn't work, 190,000 signed a petition against it. When that didn't work, over half a million took to the streets. The bill was postponed indefinitely. But that wasn't the last time Hong Kong felt the heat from mainland China. You know that whole one country, two systems thing? The Chinese Communist Party only gave a 50-year guarantee on that. What happens in 2047 when it ends? Well, they've never really said. Will the Communist Party take full power, turning it into a one country, one system? Or will Hong Kongers finally say they've had enough and demand independence? I'll continue this subject in tomorrow's episode, Mainland China Encroaches on Hong Kong. Until then, check out China Uncensored's Facebook or Twitter page for more. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.